All right, welcome to Faces and Places in Fashion here at FIT. I know we have a lot of uh, guests visiting today as well as alumni, so welcome to all of you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we do this every Monday at 4.15, uh, where we bring in speakers, executives, creative directors uh, in the fashion industry to speak uh, to students and the public alike. So again, we welcome you. Um, just as a quick side note, for next week we have um, a, an update to the schedule. We have the Under Fashion Club. Uh, we'll be doing a panel. We have nine panelists, all executives, top executives in the uh, lingerie area. Um, so th it'll be a, a, a panel discussion with them. And due to the fact that they, there are some executives that have uh, some time issues, we're going to be starting at 4.30. So the panel will start at 4.30. So just 15 minutes later than usual. All right, so I'm really uh, excited to have our speakers here today from Oscar de la Renta. Uh, we've had Melissa LaFerkob here many times in the past, and it's always uh, fun to have her here with us. Uh, just a quick uh, overview of, of Melissa's career. She began um, here at FIT, so she's an FIT alumni, uh, where she got her degree in fashion buying and merchandising. Uh, her first job was a product coordinator at Sinia Design, which led to jobs as a merchandiser at more well-known U.S. fashion companies, including Polo Jeans, The Limited, Donna Karen, and Nautica. She transferred her skills to the interna international luxury space uh, with Dolce & Gabbana. And in 2004, she became the VP of merchandising at Oscar de la Renta, with a focus on ready-to-wear and accessories. Uh, she is responsible for building an, uh, from the ground up a successful sales ne uh, network. Five years later, she promoted to the position of Senior Vice President of Merchandising and Sales, where she focuses on all lifestyle products, including fashion, jewelry, children's wear, and home. And Melissa will be speaking today uh, with Erica Behrman, otherwise known as Oscar PR Girl, right? As you all probably know. Erica is uh, the vi Senior Vice President of Global Communications for Oscar de la Renta. Her social media handle, at Oscar PR Girl, has over two million followers across platforms. She was named in Vanity Fair International, uh, she was named to the Vanity Fair International Best Dress List in 2012. And her work uh, on behalf of Oscar de la Renta has been written about in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Vogue, Elle, Town and Country, and many others. So welcome to both Erica and Melissa. Uh, I'm looking forward to a wonderful conversation. Thank you for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. How close do we get? How close do we get? Should we, can we hold these? Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so you know her as Oscar PR Girl. I know her as Erica Behrman, who joined Oscar de la Renta in 2008. Um, and as Joshua mentioned, she started as a director of communications and quickly rose through the ranks and was promoted to SVP of communications and now has two million followers um, and has really kind of changed the face of our brand. So Erica, art history major and English major from Long Island, tell me about your career leading up to your time at Oscar de la Renta. Sure, and yeah. How you got started. Um, so I, I think I'm a little bit different, you know, certainly from all of you because, um, you know, you're all students here at FIT. Um, I did not know that I wanted to work in the fashion industry. Um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I went to a liberal arts college, um, Holy Cross in Massachusetts, and I studied English, art history, women's studies. I did a lot of different things. You know, I always um, was interested in aesthetics. I thought maybe I wanted to do something in art. Um, I really wasn't sure. and. I set up a bunch of meetings in New York with really whoever I could get meetings with, you know, people that my professors knew or my parents knew or, you know, whatever. And um, I met with this guy, um, this really amazing, you know, important guy. His name is Richard Plepler. He's still at HBO. Um, you'll hear him sometimes like at the Academy Awards. They're always like, I want to thank Richard Plepler. And he's one of those people that gets named a lot. but. Um, anyway, I had a meeting with him and, you know, he was sort of like, what do you want to do? And I was probably giving him like some, you know, bullshit answer, whatever you say when you really don't know what you want to do. And he sort of looked at me like, you know, when someone's like, you know, giving you like the once over. And he said, you know, 
maybe you should be thinking about a job in fashion. And he introduced me to this amazing woman called Lila Staub, who then was the head of celebrity and VIP dressing at Giorgio Armani. And, you know, he gave me this great big billing. He was like, Lila, this is, I have your new assistant. She's sitting in my office. And I didn't end up working for Lila, but I ended up working for another woman at Armani. Um, and that's how I got my start. I was the assistant to uh, this amazing woman called Kelly McNamara, who was the head of PR for Armani Cosmetics and Fragrances, which uh, are owned you know, and run, it's a license, um, with L'Oreal. And it was just the first opportunity I got. And you know, I thought, this sounds great, you know, L'Oreal's the biggest beauty company in the world, and I went to work for this woman, Kelly, and it was cool because she was, you know, the head of the department, she was a vice president, um, and I was her assistant, and there was nobody in between us. And so I got, she let me do, like, anything and everything, and, you know, I learned, I learned so much from Kelly, but I learned a lot by doing, because she let me do things, you know, like, she would Say, she was very empowering. She would be like, well, you can call Sarah Brown, who is the beauty director at Vogue. And I was just like, I can call Sarah Brown? I don't think I, I, don't think I can call Sarah Brown, you know? Like, only you can call Sarah Brown. And, but she just, like, you know, encouraged me and, you know, never took credit for any of my work. And I got to do a lot of things um, and see a lot of things. I mean, of course, like, I still did assistant things. You know, I still went and got her dry cleaning and I used to call her every morning to wake her up. I hope, there's no press here, right? No, okay. They are videotaping. That's fine, that's yeah. fine. I, I mean, I don't know, she probably wouldn't mind, but literally I would call her every morning. I was like a human alarm clock. Um, and anyway, I sort of got bit by this fashion bug. I went, I was asked to go to um, a charity event with the girls from Armani Fashion. And I think definitely I was like a last minute seat filler. They probably had somebody drop out and they were like, ask that girl, I don't know, because she could you know, fit in a sample or I'm not really sure why. So I ended up, you know, they were like, oh, you, know, you need something to wear. So you're gonna have to come here and try on some dresses. And I went, I'll never forget it. I went to Armani Fashion and there were all these dresses, and the girl who was helping me was just like, try them on, like, you know, whatever fits, you know, you're gonna borrow, you're gonna wear it tonight. This was like a few hours before the party. And I remember, I'll never forget the dress, it was a bright orange gown, and it was, it was beautiful, it was printed. It had like a hoop skirt at the bottom, and I just put it on, and it was just like this very pivotal moment for me where I was like, you know what, if you're gonna slave away, doing something, this is not a bad way to go. And um, that was it. I'm not gonna like bore you with the rest of it. I met someone from Burberry who gave me a job uh, that I was totally unqualified for following my job at L'Oreal. Um, one of my best friends to this day, his name is John Cross, and um, sort of this mega fashion publicist. You know, in the era before social media, Nobody knew who any of these publicists were. And so John is this amazing guy who, you know, worked for Prada and worked at Burberry and, you know, but someone like John, you didn't used to know who PR people were. Um, and some people would say that perhaps it should have remained that way, but um, no. it's a whole other lecture. Anyway, so John gave me this job at Burberry and all of a sudden, you know, I was handling all the press for their men's collections, which at that time were relatively new. Burberry was still showing in Milan. This is before Angela Ahrens and before they sort of stormed and sort of like took on London Fashion Week and helped make it what it, what it is now. And really before Burberry became, you know, a tech company in a lot of ways, which is, you know, sort of what I think it has become and it's extraordinary, but it was sort of pre that. Um, you know, and the next thing I know, I was 22 and traveling to Milan for fashion shows, and you know, I just I learned a ton. And then I went on to work at uh, Christian Dior in New York. Still, I was, um, I guess, a manager and then a director at Dior, and I oversaw uh, women's editorial for the U.S. I helped with you know events and celebrity, but at those big companies, it's very different. Like, I, I'll tell you about my job at Oscar, but. 
you know, at Dior, it, the job that I do now at Oscar de la Renta, at Dior is the job of like 10 different people. First of all, Dior has 30 something offices in the world. Oscar de la Renta has just one. Um, you know, and my job is so specific. Women's editorial for the United States. So that means like I would only handle, and this was before really online and social media too. So like, I mean, there was like one web, like, it was like right at the beginning of like style.com. Like you guys don't even know, uh, like it was just, there was a time when it would, that was like the only website where that fashion people were worried about having exposure on and there were no blogs. Um, anyway, so I was at Dior for a few years and um, learned everything there. I worked for an amazing woman named Christine Westerby, who is, you know, who I consider one of my great mentors. Um, and, you know, I started traveling to Paris a lot, like six times a year for two and a half weeks each time. And I just started to feel like, so I was exposed to what was happening in the Paris office, which was their home office, their corporate office. And I was just so fascinated by what was going on there. And not that I wasn't into my job in New York, it was great, amazing, but in Paris, that was where everything was really happening. You know, that was where the designer was working. At the time, it was John Galliano. That was where his team was. That was where the communication strategy for the entire company was really being set. For example, like, this is the bag of the season. This is the shoe we're going to promote. This is what's going to be in the ad campaign. Um, this year, we're going to show our resort collection in New York or Dubai, or whatever. Basically, they made all of the decisions in Paris. Um, and in New York, we would sort of execute what those decisions were. So like if Paris said, this is the bag of the season, we would come back to New York and I would pitch that bag to Harper's Bazaar. And you know, we'd go on from there. Um, but I just became more and more fascinated with what was going on in that other office. And I was thinking that, I would like to find, you know, that sort of scenario, that sort of environment in New York. And so, you know, I was thinking I had to work for an American designer, that that was sort of like the next step for me in my career. And, you know, I would call it like a little bit of a coincidence, or maybe you believe that like there are no coincidences, um, but it was sort of by accident that I, you know, had this opportunity at Oscar. I was super happy at Dior. You know, even though I was sort of thinking about my next step, I was like, by no means looking for a job. Um, I was getting married, I was moving apartments. There were like all these other things going on. And, you know, I bumped into this guy that I knew from just years in the industry. And he, you know, had lived in London and he was like, oh, I'm moving back to New York and I'm gonna be heading up global communications for Oscar de la Renta. And I don't know, it was just like, I mean, I've always, I've always loved Oscar's aesthetic. I always knew what it was. I'll never forget, there was a picture in Vogue. It was, actually we just put it on our Facebook page like yesterday, this is sort of a random thing, but you guys should go look at it. It's a picture of Jennifer Connelly in Vogue and she's standing in these white pants and they're like these huge white pants, sort of like kind of pants, like yeah, that I'm wearing. Um, but the pants made like a big triangle on the, the page and I think I was in high school when I saw this picture and I was just like, oh my God, like what is that? What, like whose clothes are those? And you know, I looked for the credit and it said Oscar de la Renta and to me it was always like, I don't know, like sounded like a prayer, you know, like Oscar, you know, it's like a whisper, like everyone's always like Oscar. But so I knew his work, of course, and um, it just sort of worked out that I went to interview and, um, you know, things fell into place and I had this opportunity to go and work for Oscar and I, I couldn't pass it up because, you know, he's the most legendary, you know, oldest working designer in New York City. He was the first American to design couture for a French house. Um, there was just so much, and to me it always, Oscar always seemed like the most glamorous life. 
like, I don't know. This was just my own perception. Everyone's different. But to me, it was like, if you could be on a yacht in Oscar de la Renta all the time, like, why, who would do anything else? Like, I don't, I don't know. It's a silly answer, but that's what I, and in, I'm making it sound so dreamy, you know, it is, it is dreamy, and he's dreamy, and anyway, you didn't even, I don't know, did I answer the question? <laughs> so I remember, so I joined the company in 2005, which was right around the time Alex Bolin, who's our CEO, had taken over and had kind of set upon the course to modernize the brand and really um, kind of make it a game changer um, and really put Oscar in the spotlight. So um, Erica then, as I mentioned, joined in 2008. And I remember in a staff meeting, uh, we have an executive meeting every Tuesday and you kind of never know what's going to so happen. It's so interesting. Okay, so let me just happen. tell you what this meeting is. It's all of every department head. Um, so like Melissa, me, you know, the head of Fragrance and Beauty, the woman who heads up all of our retail stores, head of e-commerce, and we all sit around this table um, with Alex at the head, who's our CEO, and we literally go, I don't know, I've never done this in any other company, I don't know if other companies do this or not, but we literally go one by one, and we say what we're working on, and he sort of gives his yeah, like direction, nice. yeah, and like interjects. <laughs> Anyway, you go ahead. No, so when in, back in 2008, there was probably about seven people at the table. Now, as the company has grown, there's probably about 25. But in 2008, Erica said, I'd like to start a blog. And I said, what's a blog? Um, because, you know, I'm, well, I'm dating myself. But um, it was just something that people weren't doing at the time. And what's great is Alex has always been a huge supporter of change and moving things forward and of Erica's initiatives. So, you know, Alex was like, great, let's do it. Um, so tell me, what did you think when you were starting that? How did the idea come together? And did you ever imagine that you would be able to really change the perception of the brand? And I don't know if anyone um, saw, there was a Wall Street Journal article, I think in 2009, um, and the headline was from ladies who lunch to ladies who tweet and it really focused on Erica kind of changing the perception of the brand oh, Okay, so basically I started this company, you know, I'm the publicist for this incredible designer who you know has been designing clothes for 50 years I, I mean it really just started with me thinking like losing sleep over the fact, like, thinking how many publicists Oscar had had over the course of these years, like, amazing publicists. Like, Oscar had, Eleanor Lambert was his, one of his, like, first PR people. I don't know if you guys have, know about Eleanor Lambert or have studied her, but she basically started the CFDA. Like, these really amazing people, you know, some better than others, I guess. But in my head, I was just like, you know, what could I possibly do for this man that hasn't been done for him before. It's a very unique challenge. Like, it would be so different if I was going to, you know, and all of you will, you know, maybe find yourself in this scenario, but it's a different challenge if you're, you're going to work for someone who nobody knows and you're there to help create their reputation and, you know, really communicate about who this person is. It's a very different challenge when you go to work for someone like Oscar, who is so well established. I mean, not even, that doesn't even cover it. He's like, you know, he's, he's larger than life. And how do you make an impact in PR and communications on someone like that, who like, frankly, probably doesn't need you, you know? Like, he's so major. Um, so, what could I do for him that hasn't been done for him before? You know, I can't start the CFDA. I can't be the first person to put him on television. You know, I can't, I mean, Oscar was dressing first ladies of the United States before I was even born. So, I sort of got my answer online because it was really the only place where as a company, we hadn't done anything 
And I was just like, okay, you know, like I think this could be interesting. It's a whole group of people who may or may not know who he is. And it really started, you know, trying to, you know, there was a moment, this is like five years ago, where everyone was talking about these fashion bloggers. And, every, and nobody knew what that really meant. And everyone was like, who are Especially these bloggers? Me. And then like, you know, there were like stories in the newspaper, like these bloggers are very influential. They're influencing people. And it's like, it sounds so crazy now and so like silly, because we're so far beyond that. But there was a time when like, you know, Alex and I would talk and he would be like, how do we reach these bloggers? And back then, the best thing I could come up with was Twitter because that's where the bloggers were sharing their work and talking about fashion. And, you know, the idea was really simple. It was like, okay, we're gonna start a Twitter account, but it can't be Oscar because it's just not gonna work. And it can't be somebody pretending to be Oscar because that's not gonna work either. I mean, that sounds so ridiculous now, but back then, you know, five years ago, there were people pretending to be other people on Twitter, which is so strange. Um, but that was definitely like an option. Like if you looked at like what a bunch of different brands were doing, that was one of the strategies. Um, and then there was like that, that brand voice, which is like, you know, we opened a store in Shanghai and these are the photographs. So you could take that approach and, you know, we just, thought we'd try something different, you know? And it was Alex's idea, really, not mine. And uh, he was just like, what if it's you, you know? Just write as you would, you know, your experiences of the brand and tell people, you know, what you know, what you see about Oscar. And it turned out to be this, I don't know, I, I call it a hack. Facebook, like if you talk to any of the guys that work at Facebook, they use this word, it's a hack. A hack is um, a small solution to like a very big problem. Like for example, the like button is like the greatest hack of all time because it's so, so simple. But think about it, now it's on like every web page in the world um, and it's changed the world, literally. And so anyway, you know, the Oscar PR girl thing was like a hack. It was a small idea that turned into a big thing. And I think what was interesting, you know, at the time was because Oscar is so well known and it is so magical and there's so many people that are enamored with fashion, with the industry, everybody sitting here, is to really see a glimpse inside of what happens, you know, behind the walls of Oscar. And, um, you know, one thing that we're so lucky about is that Oscar is who Oscar is, that he is involved to the level that he is, and that there's access to him. And he, you know, we always get the question, I'm sure you do, you know, do you ever see Oscar? Is he still around? And he's, you know, in the office every day, still designing every collection. Um, so it's very authentic, you know, what Erica's writing about and, and posting. And it's just such an kind of amazing and enchanting place. And I think, you know, that's what people definitely responded to. It also um, turned out to sort of be a good thing. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Because it turns out this brand, it, it's very intimidating, or it can be. Like, I think about myself. I went to work for Oscar. You know, I was deeply entrenched in the fashion industry. Um, pretty savvy. I was 27. And I never would have gone into that store. I never would have gone into Oscar store on Madison Avenue because I think I just assumed that, I don't know, that I couldn't buy anything there. It just all seems so grand, you know, like the idea of these ball gowns that are like $20,000. And, and that's true, we sell ball gowns that are $20,000. But, you know, these days, there's a lot of Oscar de la Renta that you can get for 100, 200, you know, when you look at our jewelry collection, our home collection, I mean, yes, it's still expensive. It's still aspirational. But I think there can be something intimidating about it, you know? And one of the things that I've tried to do is to make it a little less so. And that doesn't mean taking Oscar's brand down. Believe me, I don't think that I could even do that 
if I wanted to. I don't give myself that much credit. But, you know, being a little bit more inclusive is great for our business. You know, it is. And that comes directly from Oscar. You know, it's exclusive enough already. You know, it doesn't need to be more exclusive. Um, that was sort of, sort of like a great side effect. And that was what people sort of latched onto in the beginning and started writing about. That's why I was in the Wall Street Journal, because they were like, oh, there's this girl. She's 27. She's on Twitter. She talks about, you know, hip hop and yoga. And it's Oscar. Again, it's like that whisper, like that Oscar. Yeah. And like, it seemed so irreverent in a way. Not irreverent. I don't know. It was different. It, it was, was different. fresh. And I think, you know, wearing Oscar on the subway. Um, and, you know, just bringing it to be a little more um, accessible and I think opening everyone's eyes to the breadth of product that we have, as you mentioned, you know, at different price points. Um, By the way, Melissa is the head of sales for jewelry, children's wear, and home, right? Yeah, all very affordable. So she has a lot of, like, these lifestyle categories yeah. that we're talking about. Like, she's always messing with me, like... Um, Thursday night, there was this amazing big party for Oscar at Carnegie Hall. They gave him an honor, and I was getting dressed, and, you know, in a very glamorous fashion, I'm getting dressed in, like, our bathroom, which looks a lot like yours, by the way, and um, putting on this, like, really pretty cocktail dress, and I come out, and Melissa happened to be standing right there, and she was like, I don't know, Erica, I feel like you're sort of missing earrings. You need some earrings. And anyway, she's... She did not wear them. But I, I wear so much jewelry. I, she I do. was wearing an earring when she got voted on the international best dress list. So that was that huge. I made her wear. That was so. huge. Oh, you, yeah. I did. I did. I definitely did. So one other thing. So now that you've become such a public figure, you have so many followers, 2 million followers. Um, 2.5. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't know. My slide's outdated. Uh, what's your favorite aspect of being a you know, public figure and your least favorite? And maybe we could talk a little bit about the decision to go blonde. Well, which had the office in a complete, like, split. I mean, here's what I'd say. I, I think it's my... If more people know who Oscar is and what we do as a company because of me, then I feel like I've done something. Um, the one thing I would just say, like, how... You're, how my life has changed? I don't know. Okay, so I, I was tweeting about this the other morning, and so I apologize if it's repetitive, but, um, you know, I've been reading all these articles lately about young people, specifically young women, and the effects that social media are having um, on these people, and it's like, there's been all these stories. I'm sure you guys have read some of it. It's like, depression is up, and 80% of 19-year-old women are unhappy with their bodies or, um, you know, I don't know. Social media can lead to bad performance in schools because X, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I'm not a data scientist. I'm not a sociologist. But if I've learned anything from being a little bit in the spotlight, um, it's that you can't let the opinions of others define who you are. And no matter what, you know, public people, non-public people, and that includes good opinions. Like, if people say, you're this and you're that, like, that doesn't define who you actually are. You know, I think you, you're the only person who can define that. Um, and so everyone takes a bad picture, and including celebrities. And it's just, it's not... It's not who you are. And it, it took, I mean, listen, it took me a while to figure that out, especially when people are looking at you or you have attention that's placed on you. But what's interesting is now that's every person. You know, it used to be that in order to have your photograph published somewhere, somebody had to photograph you, like the New York Times or, you know, well, whoever. Now... You don't even need that. You can photograph yourself and put it up. And so everyone is photographed, and everyone is famous to some degree, and everyone invents themselves in a way. And so I think it's really interesting, and I think 
I don't know. There's really not a point to what I'm saying, except for the fact that only you can say who you are, and you really, it's got to be hard. I mean, for young women like you guys and younger, growing up in a culture where, you know, people have to like, literally, like the heart, what you're doing. And that's a tough way to live, you know? And I just, I, it's not easy for anyone. And I'm grown up, you know? And it's, I mean, when I dyed my hair was a perfect example. I got on this whole crusade and I was like, how can young women grow up like this where everyone has an opinion about what everyone else does? I mean, I just, it's not easy. It's not easy, but um, anyway, you just have to focus on yourself and not worry about how your arms look in a picture, you know? You just can't, it's not who you are. It's not who, I mean, I don't know. I see, you know what, I work with celebrities a lot. It's part of what I do at Oscar. I dress celebrities for the red carpet. And, um, you know, a lot of these women are deeply, deeply insecure. And, you know, there's some of, first of all, there's some of the most beautiful women in the world. So that's like a weird thing that they are so insecure and they look a certain way. But that's not even really the point. Like, you just want to tell them, like, you're fine. Like, you're great. Like, you're going to the Golden Globes. You're going to sit, you know, right behind, you know, Robert De Niro. Like, you're being dressed by Oscar de la Renta. Like, you're you should be so proud of yourself and you look so beautiful and it's but nobody can give that to you you know nobody you have to do that for yourself and it's not you know as easy as it sounds you know i still have to stop myself and be like you can't obsess over how you look in a photograph or whatever that's it um now Circling back a little to life at Oscar, I know there's no typical day, um, but tell us a little bit about kind of what a typical day could look like, kind of your range of activities, favorite things that you do, things that are a little challenging. Well, the best thing for me that happens is a morning when Oscar calls me at like 7.30 to talk about something that's in the news, whether it's something about him, something about someone else, someone he might consider a competitor or what, like, th that's like the most like fun way to start, you do know? You, do you have to read all the papers prior to that? I mean, I sort of read, read them like during the night, like sometimes I only like, well, so Women's Wear Daily sends out their morning email blast at like 3 a.m. So I usually wake up, I don't know, it's like my body tells me that that's up and then I read it because I don't know, lately Oscar's been in the news a lot and, you know, I mean, which is great. Um, but there's always something that is relevant to us or interesting to us. And so I read women's wear, just like the headlines at three or four. And, um, you know, and then I have Google alerts for everything, you know, his name, our CEO's name, my name, whatever, that come in throughout the night. And then there's also like my ads on my Twitter feed because if I miss something, like, it, someone's going to write it at me. So I end up seeing everything else that way. Um, there's a lot to keep up on. But, and it's a lot of, I don't know, it's all good. And, you know, you read things and it helps you, it, it informs your decisions, you know, on stuff. And I might read something in the morning that triggers an afternoon, a, a thought or an idea that, you know, comes into play that comes up in a meeting in the afternoon and it ends up being a huge thing, you know? And then the next thing you know, you're going to Singapore for a fashion show in the middle of May, which is, we are actually. But um, anyway, that's just an example of like how things, you know, sort of come up and go. Um, right now, we're doing a lot of fittings for uh, the Costume Institute Gala, which I'm sure you all know is coming on Monday. Um, we're dressing a lot of women. Wow. Yeah, so I have like fittings can't say who. all day long. Although Oscar told a huge newspaper today, one of the people that we're dressing, so we'll see how that goes when that comes out. Um, no, but it's things like that. Like he had a phone interview with the Financial Times today, so putting them on the phone. We had a celebrity fitting at 11. We had a meeting um, at 
2.30, which I like had to run out of to come here, about someone who wants to make a film about Oscar, which who knows? That's not the first time we've had that meeting. Lots of people have come to us and have wanted to make a film. And um, it's all fun. I mean, I look after advertising, editorial, celebrity events. Um, we just had a bridal show last month. We're gonna have um, a resort presentation the second week of May. So my job in the shows is like everything but the clothes, basically. So Oscar and his team put together the collections. Me and my team organize everyone else. So like, you know, from the stylist to hair and makeup to the guy that comes in and hangs the lights, we invite the press and we sort of organize everything else that has to do with the show. Um, that's it. I mean, we, we're shooting an ad campaign. campaign. <laughs> um, we're shooting an ad campaign at the end of February, I hope. So right now we're like deciding where to shoot it. Um, you know, we're looking at locations and obviously I have people who help me with that and we all make the decision like collectively, you know, with Oscar and Alex, what we're gonna do, where we're gonna do it, who the models are gonna be, who the photographer is. And then the next step of that is like, where are you gonna run your ads? You're gonna run them, you know, Vogue, Town and Country, Elle, are you gonna switch it up? Are you gonna run more in one magazine or less? Are you gonna come out of a magazine completely or whatever? Um, and then the magazines are start, editorially, they're starting to work on their fall issues too. So like we showed our fall collection February, February. And um, the magazines are shooting fall stories now, the ones that start to come out in July, August. So we're working on that, you know, and it's not just ready to wear, it's accessories, children's wear, home. Um, it's exciting. It, you know, the one thing, the really interesting thing that's happened at Oscar over the last five years is it's really been, or 10 years, I guess, sort of a transition from a ready to wear house to a lifestyle brand. And it's a lot of growing pains, you know? It's like, it's not easy. And Melissa can tell you better than anyone because some of those businesses, for example, like children's wear, we've been doing children's wear for two years. That's it. It's like a startup, even for us even though it's Oscar and it's very well established and he started his company in 1965. Children's Wear is still a startup. So one of the things um, that I still kind of pinch myself about is just, you know, how um, open and inviting and fun and playful and witty Oscar is and, um, you know, just him being there and every day. Um, what are some of your favorite Oscar stories? I know there's a lot. Oh my God, I out. have so many. I just, honestly, that man, he's, he's, I don't know, he's wonderful. And, you know, there's a reason why he's had the success that he's had. And it's obviously because he's an immensely talented designer, but also because he's a magnetic human being, you know, and he cares about people. And, you know, he talks to you like you're the only person in the room. And it's real, it's genuine. He talks to everyone in the same way. It doesn't matter if you're Hillary Clinton or, you know, the guy who cleans our office. You know, everyone is the same. And um, I don't know, he's funny. He's an amazing sense of humor. He doesn't stop teasing you. I mean, he saw something the other day Oh, well, first of all, when I dyed my hair, he started calling me Blondie, and he still hasn't stopped. And then he was playing this game where he, when I changed it back to my natural color, he was playing this game like he doesn't recognize me. And, but, he de but he wears out the joke. And so he, he'd be like, you know, there used to be this girl. And he has this very amazing, smooth Spanish accent, and I'm gonna butcher it, but he was just like, such a nice girl, really smart, you know, you'd be like, oh, she was very pretty. Erika, what happened to Erika? And like, it, he just, he's so, honestly, he's so funny. He's hilarious. He has the best jokes. And, um... He's slightly naughty sometimes. Oh, he's totally naughty. He's totally naughty. He, he told us that blondes have more fun, but brunettes age better. Yeah. And, right, and also that men marry brunettes. 
I don't know. He's got all these theories, but he's he's just so funny. There's this older there's this guy who works in our company. I we can't name any names, but um, he's been working with Oscar for like 30 years. They're great buddies. They're obviously very comfortable with each other, and he's adorable. I mean, when he was young, he was super handsome. He was like a model, and now um, he's like an older guy, and he looks great. But you know, he came into the studio the other day, and like he's got a little you know like a little tummy. And Oscar was like, when is the baby due? You know, and he's like saying, I mean, just like funny stuff, you know. Um, Naughty. But it makes it so enjoyable, you know. I mean, like, we're all, we all work hard. We all are getting a job done, you know. But at the end of the day, we make dresses. And it's supposed to make people happy. Um, it's not a heavy, difficult process, and, you know, I've really learned that from him, from him, you know, and that's what fashion is about. It's about making people feel good about themselves at the end of the day, um, and he really, like, lives that. He has fun, and I think, you know, when the, you know, they're gathering the models for the run, you know, give the pep talk, they always say, you're at Oscar, you're supposed to smile, because it is, it's a happy and kind of fun place, and that comes you know, really from Oscar. Oscar hates sad faces. Hate. He always says that, I don't like sad faces. So I'm sure um, everyone has some questions. If we, do we have time for a QA? and a Just maybe parting words, any advice for the students on how to get started? Um, I guess what I would say, the most important thing that I've learned so far um, is just that like, no one's gonna do it for you. Whatever you want, Whatever you want to be, you have to do it for yourself. You know, you have to go out and get what you want. You have to make the job you want for yourself. Um, and you have to make the life that you want for yourself, moreover. And also, you know, a small idea is what becomes big. You know, think about the like button or a Twitter account or whatever. That's like, that's how. That's how the world gets changed, you know? Small ideas, and you don't ever discount it. Like, I remember in the beginning of this whole Oscar PR girl thing, like, we used to laugh about it a little bit. Like, I would talk about it in the staff meeting, and like, so, like you know, someone would be like, all right, Oscar PR girl. Like, we used to joke around about it, and now, you know, now those same people are calling me up being like, can you post this? Can you post this? We need you to tweet about this. You talk about this, and the trunk show, and da 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 and but like, you just want to be like, okay, who's laughing now? You know, now it's like a big thing. And oh, um, oh, look at him. Um, anyway, you know, and you have to do it for yourself. And no one's gonna tell you exactly how to do anything. You know, you just have to figure it out. You have to make your own path. Um, and you will. Yeah, if you want to. You know, and if I just did my job, if I, you know, I was hired at Oscar to be the PR director, you know, and if I just did that, you know, I wouldn't be here. Um, so don't ever, like, accept a first offer, you know? You have to push it a little bit. And I have just a few quick, obviously, here's Erica, pre- pre-show with Oscar, going over probably some last minute questions or something. And then, as we mentioned, there's more than 200, 2 million followers across all platform. And here's some of the numbers. Um, you wanna share some, talk about some no, of them? No, I mean. I think for themselves. Yeah, the only so. thing I would say is, I'm just proud that like we built them organically. We built them from zero. You know, we've never advertised on any of these platforms. And we actually have smaller communities than some of the other brands, but it's because we took a risk. It's not called Oscar de la Renta. We took a different approach. Um, you know, but I know that all of these people are, you know, they're diehard and they care about what we're doing. So. I gathered some of your most liked Instagram. So, like I said, Erica rides the subway. I've actually ran into her on the subway before. Look at that guy. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, what is she wearing? He's like, who is that? Yeah. So, and you can see some of the fun comments on the side. It's always fun to see 
um, what people have to say. This was, of course, the best dress outfit, right? No? No. Oh, but you're wearing this a great earring. So See? I, I wear earrings. I, I brought her earrings for this look. Um, this is another great one. 12,000 likes. More gowns, 13,000. Gowns are the most popular Ga on Instagram. Are the most popular, as you can tell. And shoes, beautiful, beautiful shoes. So just some of the fun Instagrams over the last few years. So we'll take questions. Oh, oh I'm supposed to pick. OK, go right ahead. No, uh, Melissa did. Melissa did. Oscar, um, Oscar actually didn't study to be a fashion designer. He studied to be a painter. He went to college in Madrid, um, a famous art school. I can't remember the name. Um, but he studied drawing and painting, and that's what he left. He was born in the Dominican Republic, and he left the Dominican Republic to study in Spain and be an artist. And um, he sort of came into fashion by accident. He started doing sketches for uh, the House of Balenciaga, which was based in, in Spain, uh, just to make money. Like, you know the way that we have lookbooks now? It used to be sketches um, that they would send to the clients to place their orders. And so that's how Oscar sort of came into the world of fashion. Of course I will. Of course I will. It's an amazing night. Were you were you there on Thursday? Yeah. 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 No. He he's done an amazing you know amount of things for Carnegie Hall and you know this particular party you know was a record for them in terms of fundraising and. He's super dedicated. It's a great group of people. Mm -hmm. the audience that um, actually like follows Twitter, like, what were some of the biggest challenges? I'd say, like, how did you get them to notice? Like. Um, first of all, I, I wouldn't say it was a rebranding. Um, it was really just more spreading the message, like spreading the original, you know, message of Oscar and to a new group of people. Um, and in a new way, you know, I mean, I haven't changed what Oscar's brand is. I think I only sort of shifted how we talk about it and to whom. Um, you know, the challenges in the beginning is like, you're just like, okay, I mean, literally, I remember when I first, I remember when we, the, my Twitter account had like 20 followers, and I was like, this is amazing. Who are these 20 people? They want to know what's going on with us. And like, you just have to keep talking, you know? I wish there was some like secret sauce, but, um, you know, in the beginning, it was like, is any, I mean, and then you have like your moments of doubt where you're like, is anyone listening? Is this gonna do anything? Like, why are we doing this? Um, but you know, I just kept at it. Was it sort of like that hack that you mentioned, perhaps, that kind of? Yeah, I don't know, I think the timing was right. Like if I was, it's weird because if I was gonna start a Twitter account now for Oscar de la Renta, I wouldn't, I don't think I would start Oscar PR Girl. Like, the t it's, time has changed. I'm not saying it's not relevant. It's great, and it was what we did, and I think there's value in it. Um, but there was something about the time was right, and people just thought it was so crazy. They were like, Oscar? You know, like, and there's this girl, this young girl, like, who's this girl? She doesn't know anything about Oscar. Like, writing these things about him and taking pictures of him in the airport and you know whatever else I was doing to be like this is an amazing man and a really cool world that not everyone has access to 
Um, so yeah, I think it was, I think, like anything else, you know, the timing has to be right for whatever it is. Thank you. You seem to be an actual publicist. You just exude it, and you exude like a, an energy, and it comes off, it seems sort of natural. Like it's not like you're faking it. And I have, I'm an alum, I'm not a younger person. Yeah. So twi like Instagram doesn't come like totally naturally to me. And I have my own company, and I don't really know how to do PR. Like it's, and it's just me, so how do I make it N like natural, like I don't want to take a bunch of selfies of myself and be like, look at how great I am, because it would just seem sort of silly, you know? Yeah. And so how do you make it, um, like what advice would you give? I mean, for you in the situation that you just described, um, I think the problem with publicists general, generally is that a lot of them are not natural. And yeah. a lot of it is very forced. And when someone says like, sometimes when someone says that like, you know, she's this kind of publicist. I like cringe a little bit, and I'm like, I don't know if I'm really that well, you person. Know, you have an energy, a positive energy. Like just yeah, sort of but I mean, I think the best thing that you could do is you have to think about in your mind if like someone was at a cocktail party and they were talking about your company and like they were like, oh, it's this really great company, it does this. Like, what's the one line, sentence, that you would want someone else to say about your brand. And then that's how you have to approach all of your PR. And does it fit into that? Does it reinforce that? You know? Thank and like, you. Oh, sure. That's good. No, that's good. That's good. Like, that's at really the, good at the end of the day, like when you're not around yeah. and someone was saying something about your brand, what is it? That's and, if, and, and that's your communication strategy. You boil it down to that one sentence okay. and you can build everything off of that. I'm Catherine, thank you for being here, I'm an alumni. And I was wondering, I mean, how throughout your career you realize your call and also like, you made in a way your steps, but then how do you know that that's the right thing for you and how do you go throughout your next step in your career? Like, yeah, I see what you're saying. I think you have to use your instincts, you know, and you have to go with your gut and you just have to do what feels right at the time. And I don't know, I think, I think things happen the way that they should. I don't know if that's like too, you know, spiritual and not rational enough, but I don't know. Like I remember the job offer at Oscar, it was the worst timing in the world for me. And I still was like, you know what? I have to do this. I ha it's like, it's the right thing. You know, it's just, I was saying in the car ride over here, like, you don't know what to do until you do, you know? And sometimes you just have to think about it that way. Like, you don't, that sounds like so simple and stupid, but, you know, you don't know what the answer is or what's right for you or if this is the right thing until it just hits you and you're like, and you know that it's right. You know, so I think you just have to, you know, listen to all those voices inside of you and, you know, use your best judgment. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is actually a two part question. If you, um, when you first started, um, you know, on Twitter, how did you decide your voice and then how has that evolved? Um, over the years and expanded into the different um, platforms in social media? Well, the voice thing was pretty easy because it was just my voice. It was me. It was, you know, it was me talking about Oscar. So, like, I just tried to think of it in my head, like, as, like, a storyteller or, like, a tour guide. And then I sort of, like, started mixing in like random thoughts and like things about me and that people were interested in that and so I did more of that. And you know what, it's changed a lot. I think the voice has changed as I've changed 
personally, as our brand has changed, as a company, and as the platforms have changed. Because the platforms have changed a lot. Like I was talking to this young woman the other day, and she was like, I just have to say this. Um, you don't post your outfit every day anymore, and I really wish you did. And she was like coming down on me hard on Instagram for not posting my picture every day. Because I guess there was a time when I was like posting more pictures of myself. And I was thinking about it and I was like, how did I, how did that change? And it was sort of like, I was reacting to like a trend on the platform because it was like the rise of the selfie and everyone was taking pictures of themselves and still are and I still will too, but um, I, it didn't feel unique anymore. Something that I used to do, I used to always take a picture of my outfit in a mirror and then like it sort of felt like it was mainstream and I was like, okay, I, I can't do this every day. And I also got sick of it as a person. Like, what if your outfit is not that great? You know? And that, but that's like, I'm a real person, you know? I'm not a Barbie. And um, anyway, like, so things like that have evolved and changed. You know, I think Twitter has changed a lot. I think now it's like very news driven. There used to be a lot more tweets actually. Like when I, like, maybe two, one year, two years ago, there were more tweets. Now I feel like people tweet less, and that has to do with the rise of Instagram. You know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, and so all the platforms continue to change, you know? I mean, Facebook just keeps getting bigger and bigger, and our audience is like, I don't even know anything about our audience on Facebook because there's, like, it's so big and there's so many different types of people. Um, like, I pretty much know on Instagram that it's like a fashion-obsessed, young person, um, you know, for the most part. But as all of these platforms grow, you know, they're opened up to more people, you know? And like all of a sudden, like, you know, my grandmother's best friend is like commenting on my pictures. And you're just like, this world is so weird. It used to be all young tech savvy people that were like so engrossed in these platforms. And now it's like not that way at all. Like there was some photo of me on Facebook the other day and like some woman was like, you played with my daughter, you guys were in nursery school together, you know, and it's just like, I mean, it's just funny, and it's like sort of an interesting, I don't know. And, and in terms of how you like evolve your strategy, I mean, for me, the only way I can do that is by doing it myself, by really being the person who, you know, uses the, these platforms, reads my feed every day, follows as many people as possible. And honestly, I just try and think about like what I would wanna see. Like what do you wanna see? You open up your Instagram feed, you're not looking for something specific. You're, you wanna be fed things, you wanna be entertained. And so like I always keep that in my mind, like it has to be entertainment at the end of the day because I think that's what social media is. I don't, you know, it's like I hope that it's all like Oscar TV you know, in a way. And I don't want it to become like a catalog or a website. And it will a little bit, inevitably, because we're showing product and that's what we sell and this is a business. Um, but for me, I think it's really important that it maintains that, that entertainment value. Hi. Hi, I'm Cheryl, and I am a graduate of FIT. Um, first of all, I want to say kudos for the idea, because I think I credit you with being the first person to think of this, of pinning the images to Pinterest at New York Fashion Week in real time. I thought we that invented was, that. Yeah, that was brilliant, and I just loved that Thank idea you. because it's so hard. You know, pictures—they're so blurry off the runway as the editors, buyers, bloggers are trying. They're getting to take better them. though. The editors at, and all—they're taking pictures. You know. Yeah, That's they're getting interesting. How it's all changed. They're getting better and everything, but I just thought that was really brilliant. Okay, Thank but you. my question really is, um, in terms of like growing your social media presence, um, I noticed that you do have conversations with one-on-one -on -one with people, and you respond to them and you answer them, and then. You will say things that you're at, you know, at the CVS or you're doing this or whatever. How do you achieve the balance between how much of your social media is about you as a person and your personal life as opposed to your working life at Oscar de la Renta? 
It's, I mean, it's an excellent question. Um, it's always changing. And it, for me, it's been very instinctual. You know, I was, I never thought that I was going to be talking about myself or showing myself or anything like that. It goes back to like what I was saying about how publicists, you never used to know who they were. And so I didn't start this to promote myself. And actually, it's still like my great fear that anyone would say that I've put that before promoting him um, because he's, he is my priority. But it's social media and it's personal. And if you're gonna be a person, you have to be a person. And you have to say that you know, you're at CVS doing something or whatever. And I, I, that's how you build a relationship, I think, with your followers. You know, they know who you are, they know who's talking. You know, they know me, you know, they know things about me. And if that means that when I say we're doing a, a live pinning of the show and check it out and here's the link and people do that because they know me or they like me or whatever, th then I'll take it, you know? It's like how a recommendation from a friend can be more meaningful than an ad, you know, you might ask your friend, you know, oh, you have this car, what do you think of this car? And somehow that is better and stronger than an ad you might see for a car in a magazine um, because you trust them, you know, and I don't know, people, that's like what life is about, that's what marketing is about, I don't know, I don't know. But it's, it's, it's not easy, it's not easy, but um, I think ultimately it's been worth it. It's been good for us. Is the, the handle Oscar De Laurenta, is that just someone faking you guys? You don't I don't know. That, right? I think we might have held that a while ago. I don't, is there, is there a handle Oscar De Laurenta? Yeah, but it's an egg and there's no tweets. Right. It, that, it's probably us holding on to it for the future because I think I held the name on these platforms. Um, because we might need it. Yeah, I was gonna say, like sometimes it's frustrating because you know you live tweet the red carpet arrivals, where I do all the co time constantly, and I'm always, you know, I'll say at Calvin Klein at DKNY. Right. But with you guys, I can't like, I'll, you know, wearing at Oscar PR girl. Just I know. Sounds funny. Yeah, I mean, listen, we talked about it then. We talk about it now. You know, I was thinking about it the other day. I was like looking at. Um, this article about Instagram and it was showing a lot of the top fashion brands and their followings and a lot of our competitors, they have so many more followers than we do. And there's a lot of things that go into that, you know, um, part of it has to do with the size of their Facebook communities because of the, you know, Instagram being so closely linked to Facebook. And so a lot of these brands have spent a lot of money in advertising on Facebook. So their Facebook communities are, you know, tens of millions. And as a result, by posting, you know, in, anyway, uh, it's boring. But there's also an organic lift of people just searching for your brand name. And so there's a benefit to that too. So I started thinking about Instagram and I was like, should we change Instagram to Oscar de la Renta? Because organically, we're gonna pick up more followers just because people will search it. And if they don't, you can only find Oscar PR Girl if, you're, if you know to look for it. You know, it's like you're less likely to stumble upon it. And as the community grows, you know, it could be a meaningful difference. So who knows, maybe we'll change it. I guess what I'm saying is I don't have it all figured out and we just have to do the best that we can as we go. How important is it for somebody uh, who's just starting up a little fashion accessories business, like freelance, nowhere, I'm not talking about the scale of Oscar de la Renta, believe me. How important is it to have celebrity backing if it's even, if it should even be considered? Well, I don't mean backing, but maybe. You mean like they carry your bag on a carpet or? Yeah, maybe something like that. Or, or should I be so interested in getting a silk flower pin to Melania Trump or is it not something I should be focusing on? I think it Thank depends you. on what it is. I think celebrity can be very, very effective. 
vary. I mean, depending on what it is, I mean, it's still, you know, largely because of television and because of the weekly magazines and just because of like our overall obsession with celebrity, you know, it can, I mean, for example, the Academy Awards, of all the things I do all year, the Academy Awards gets the most press. Number one, more than anything. And there's a value in that, you know? It's millions of people that watch the red carpet on E! That um, read People Magazine and Us Weekly, you know, all over the world. Um, you know, a pin on someone who, I don't know, I mean, you, you have to sort of measure risk reward, so, you know, you think about, okay, it's gonna cost me this much to give her this, and, you know, I think you have to accept the fact that you may not get anything back. You know, I tell people in our company this, when they're like, oh, can you send out, like, 25 bags to celebrities? I say to them, yes, I can, but you have to be prepared for the fact that not one person may carry it. Or they might carry it, but they went to visit their grandmother and there were no photographers. Or they gave it to their grandmother because they didn't like it that much. You know, so like you sort of have to be prepared for the fact that nothing might happen. And if you hound that person, then they're really not going to wear your pen. So um, I don't know. I think you have to think about, you have to measure what it is. But I mean, listen. Yeah, I mean, if you have the resources and you have it, and it, listen, I used to say this when I worked at Burberry, but it was my job to send out samples to magazines and, and stuff, and my, my boss at the time would be like, why are you sending them so much stuff? And he was like very territorial about the samples, and he would be like, they don't need all those things. And I would tell him that it was better off sitting in their office than ours, because at least something could happen over there. Like, someone could pick up those shoes and wear them out, or like, the editor-in-chief could come in and need a dress that night, and she could pull it, and then she's in the Wall Street Journal the next day. Or, you know, randomly, I don't, I mean, all these, like, things are like very random and opportunistic. So, I think if you have the things lying around, they're better off with somebody else than they are with you, because something might happen, but you can't expect you know, for something to work, unless you're paying someone, which brands do that too, but not as you're starting out, usually you don't have the money to pay someone to wear something. I wish I could see you guys. <laughs> Is it very bright? Should we bring up the lights a little bit? Thank you so much for being here. I just uh, wonder, what are you working on next? What's your future plan? What are you focusing on? What's your goal for the next couple of months or year? Um, well, May is a really busy month for us. We have a lot of things, events to get through, like some of the things I, I mentioned earlier. We have the Met Ball. We have our resort presentation. We're going to Singapore to do a fashion show in the middle of the month, and then at the end of the month, we have to shoot our ad campaign. So. Those things will keep me very busy in May. Um, and then, I don't know. I mean, we work on putting the show together for September. Um, I don't know. I just try to tell more people who Oscar is, you know, every day. And those, those opportunities, you know, some of them we plan a year in advance, and some of them just come day by day. So I'm just going to try and keep my head above water. All right. Thank you so much, Erica and Melissa, for coming. Thank we appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank and you. I, <laughs> and I want to invite everyone. We do have a reception downstairs and food, so you're all welcome to join us uh, downstairs. <laughs>